Alright, uh, morning everyone, thanks for being here today. Um, Alright, so assignment two, the description is up. I don't have a grading infrastructure 100% up because it took me a little while to actually set up the second part, um, much longer than I anticipated. So assignment two, you are going to have two weeks. The first part of that assignment is data exfiltration. What does exfiltration mean? Getting stuff off the server. Getting stuff out, right? It's the opposite of infiltration, right? Infiltration, you're trying to break into somewhere. But once you break in, especially in a security context, right, you want to get data out. So how do you get data out of a system? This is not a trick question. Send it over to water. And you just send it back to yourself, right? Or send it to another machine you control. Probably the best way if you want to hide your tracks is to break into a third machine, right? And like send the data from that first place to that machine you broke into and then transfer it to yourself or maybe transfer it to somebody else, right? So you create these series of misconnections between yourself. So let's say, put yourself in you know, Albert Gonzalez's shoes. You've broken into the Heartland credit card payment system, right? This is not some realtor. This is a credit card processing firm that's processing millions of credit cards. So they have a huge database of all of their users' credit cards. So how do you get that back? Do you just rsync FTP it back to yourself? Maybe. What would be a better way? What would be the problem with that? If you just, I don't know, somebody give me an estimate. Somebody who kind of works with databases. How much would like 200 million credit cards be plus all the customer information? Sending yourself 100 gigs of data. What was that? Yeah, create noise or some kind of blip, right? There's going to be something that's not, you know, uh, if the company is secure, right, or they think they're secure and they have good security practices in place, which you would hope from a credit card payment processor they are. You would hope that they're monitoring their traffic so they could see a huge spike like that and try to investigate what's going on. If they're really good, they have some taps and some network traces in their networks so they can figure out you know, exactly what's going on. Uh, but either way, you've just alerted them now that you're on their system, right? So is that good? Now you can play like a cool cat and mouse game with them? What's your ideal scenario? What's the attacker's ideal scenario? You get in there undetected, you steal all the data, and you remain undetected. So you can steal new data. I'm running out of fingers. You can steal new data, and you can use that vantage point to launch other attacks to other institutions, right? Maybe they end up partnering with another company, so now you have a VPN connection from their company to the second company that you can then leverage to exploit this new company, right? So as an attacker, you want to stay on as long as you possibly can, and you want to remain undetected. Right? That's the big thing. Okay, so this is where data exfiltration comes in. So if we can't, if we want to say let's not send ourselves to 100 gigabytes of data that's going to do this huge spike, what are some of our other options? Distribute it or whatever, like botnets. Yeah, we could distribute it maybe out. So distribute the yeah. fan out the data in some yeah. sense, right? So send 10 megs to a bunch of different machines that we control and then aggregate them coming back? Yeah. What would be some of the problems there? We're still sending it out into the same internet pipe. Right, so if they're looking at their aggregate bandwidth usage, right, maybe that 100, it's still 100 to 200 gigs you're transmitting. So what really are they using to detect you? Should, they should. Well, be credit card numbers have to check digitally, yeah. So it's really easy. 
check you. How can they tell that there's this like 10 gigabyte spike or something? Abnormal like traffic pattern. <laughs> what is the traffic pattern based on? Request and response. Request and responses? All request responses? Are they looking at every single request and response they've ever gotten? What are they looking at? Right, that's where they're going to look for it. What was that? Do you have a hand up there? Uh, actually, the user traffic will have like two points of delay here. So there will be that to the user traffic. And then there will be a spike that will go back to the user traffic. Uh, so so how do they detect that spike? What are they using? How do they detect it? I mean, yeah. I feel like it's just looking for a uh, throughput threshold. How do you calculate a throughput threshold? What is, how is throughput calculated? NetFlow or what's, what's the data? Yeah. So probably we are not going to investigate ARP packets and ping packets, and apart from those, we are going to check the fields of the IP. If, uh, I mean the, the length of the IP packets and add them up over a minute to understand what the throughput. Add is. them over what? Maybe over a minute and. Over a minute. Why a minute? Uh, I I just chose a number. Right. Okay. So to calculate throughput, how do you calculate throughput? Data over time, yeah. right. right? So you can't really, can you, you can maybe try to compress the data component, but at some point there's a limit, right? You still want to get 100 gigs out. So what component can you mess with? The time, right. yeah, right? Yeah, you want to get credit cards timely, but you know, I'd rather not get detected. So what if you just send a mega, a mega day, right? That's fine. And then spread that mega out over an entire day, right? Out to, I don't know, 24 chunks or something like that, and do one every hour, right? Then you're never gonna get this spike, right? You're gonna flatten out that spike and distribute that, and hopefully your traffic will blend in with the noise, the random fluctuations of their network, right? So that's kind of the idea is, okay, you can, it's hard to change the data, but you can maybe split the data out, fan out the data, but even then you're still sending a massive amount of data you gotta realize they're doing this over time. So if you can take be slower, you can actually improve your data exfiltration. Uh, the other thing is, yes. So if they are uh, checking for credit card numbers, if they're looking for weird FTP connections, right? That's going to be a problem. So the other thing we can try to do is try to encode data in bits or parts of packets or random requests or something to make it look like it blends into the normal traffic or to just make it look like irregular traffic that they're never gonna look at. So the goal of this part is we're going to write a program that exfiltrates data using an IP diagram. So why do we, so can we just do arbitrarily any protocol we want? Can we put this data anywhere? Can we put data in the destination IP? No, right, we need it to come to us. We need to control that, right? Um, and we need to be able to read that data on the receiving end, right? So it can't just be arbitrary. So that's why we, uh, we're gonna define a protocol and then your goal is gonna be to implement that protocol in a program that's able to do that. So your program is gonna be called Secret Sender. I think that's what's secret, right? Okay, good. Uh, the interface, you're going to run it. You're gonna pass the IP address, the destination IP address, you're gonna pass the interface <coughs> on which to send the packet. You're going to pass in the type. We'll see there's three types of packets that you're gonna send. So remember IP by itself, right, usually carries a higher level packet. So this is gonna allow you to configure how to hide. And finally, the message that we wanna send. So this is just gonna be a string input. So basically your goal is to get a string transmitted from one system to another by encoding data into IP packets that conform to whatever type we send here. Questions on high level interface? All right. So yeah, you're gonna encode the message, send it to that IP address using that physical interface. Why do you need the interface? to get a raw socket on so it's a lot easier if you specify it. So that's ease of view. 
So type's gonna be one of three. If it's a one, it's gonna be ICMP echo request message. What's, what common program uses ICMP echo requests? Bang, bing, bing, bing. Um, otherwise, it'll be, two will be a TCP send packet to port 80 on that machine, right? So why is this handy from a exfiltration perspective? You need to establish a TCP connection. <coughs> you know if the port is busy or not. From the exfiltration, so how does this help this packet get out? Can what was that? Yes. Does that help it get out? Yeah, right, so to the firewall, right, this just looks like we're trying to start a web request to some IP address. Mm -hmm. How's that ever gonna fly? You know, the fact that we don't send a Synac pack maybe should fly something at some point, but the firewall definitely should let port 80 request through, right, most likely, because otherwise the employees can't visit websites, right? Uh, otherwise, three will be a UDP packet sent to port 53, what's port 53? So that also helps because you know you can make you should be able to make DNS requests to any DNS server and hopefully your system supports that. So how will you structure the TCP SYN packet and the UDP packet? Do you have to mess with them or do anything with them? Protocol. So here we have from the IP diagram RFC, which you should review if you want a review. Right. So here we have the IP diagram. Right. So can we put anything in version? Yes. You want to mess with the IP version? Huh? can only be v4 or v6, right? But then we have to change IP addresses, right? Then we have to support IPv6 addresses, which is a completely different protocol. So short answer is no. For IPv4, which is what we're gonna be doing, we don't wanna mess with version. The header length, can we mess with this? So I want you to try to think about like, okay, where can we put this data? How did I figure out where to put that? Can we do it in the header length? No, well, we can't make the header length not be the correct length, right? Otherwise the packet's gonna be dropped by the operating system. Yeah. We could maybe encode some data in the size of that header length and make extra fake options or something. That could be an option. Maybe I'll do that next time. The type of service, can we put data in there? What does that actually do? Type of service to the upper. Yeah, we could we could do it in there. I think it actually, I think the, I think it tells you what the protocol is underneath. Yeah, it tells you what the protocol is underneath. The total length, probably don't want to mess with it for the same reason as the header length, right? We don't want to mess with that too much. What about the identification? What was that used for? What was it? For fragmentation, yeah. Can we? What did the specs say we, that this number has to be? Does it put any limitations on what this could be? Does it have to be four or six, like, version? No, right? So we can put, actually, data in here inside this identification field. Then we have the flags. We probably don't want to mess with the flags too much. What about the fragmentation offset? sending a fragmented packet, maybe we could play with that. Because remember, this packet doesn't need to be interpreted by a higher level program, right? We don't care about what the data is inside this IP packet. We care about the information we're injecting in this header. Okay, time to live, we probably don't want to mess with. That would be dangerous, right? If you try to encode and send a zero byte and it's zero in here, right? That would be bad. 
Protocol, oh no, protocol is the lower level. Yeah, I think type of service is the QoS stuff, which um, is not really used. So maybe we could actually play with that. The checksum, can we play with the checksum? No, right? No. <laughs> checksum's invalid, it gets dropped along the way, right? So we definitely don't want to do that. Uh, source address. It's tricky. We might be able to. Right, we can, we can, uh, we've seen, right? We can arbitrarily spoof, arbitrarily spoof source addresses on IP packets. But there's no guarantee that the firewall is going to allow packets that are not come from that network, right? They could have a rule there, or the upstream ISP from our victim could have a rule to drop those packets. So it's probably safest if this source address comes from the address of the actual machine that we're on. Yeah. Can we modify the just the host part of the yeah source address, and not the network part? So I guess it might come off from the firewall. Possibly, but it's tricky because we have to know exactly what, what network we're on. on the exactly. Firewall. Yeah. Um, and so just to not deal with that, let's try to make it at least as safe as possible. And destination address, I think it's pretty obvious we can't mess with. It, right. I won't get we could add stuff into options, but that could be fishy depending on how we're doing it, right? So if we see a packet with a bunch of weird options that don't really make sense, we'll probably drop it. And you could do something with the padding. Maybe you encode information into the padding. Okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on the identification and the fragment offset. Okay, so every byte of our message we're gonna <laughs> encode into an IP layer of one packet. So bytes of message are going to correspond one-to-one -one with packets. So we're going to use one packet to send to every byte. All right, you can think maybe we could configure the time that we do that, right, to slowly exfiltrate the data. What we're going to do is we're going to first, so we're going to send a byte at a time. So we're going to encode that byte into the high eight bits of the identification. So high in this is going to be here, right? Zero through eight. So we think about it as a 16 byte mm -hmm. number, right? The high bits are going to be the first eight bits. <laughs> so that's going to be how we send data, right? So whatever those eight bits are, that's where you consider. We're going to turn that into a byte and say that's the character of our message. So what do we know about IP? What does IP give us connection-wise, datagram-wise? Source IP and destination IP, what does it give us in terms of communication guarantees? No guarantees. No guarantees, right? So packets can get lost, packets can get duplicated, right? Is that good if we're trying to like exfiltrate some data? Yes. What if our data gets lost? Don't we want to know? Right? So we don't want to necessarily use TCP, right? Because we want to hide this into other, uh, other protocols, but we want to borrow the ideas of TCP, right? So one thing, what if our packets come out of order? How do we know which, which byte corresponds to what message byte? Maybe add something in the identification so that we can know which packet is after the order of the... Yeah, right, so we wanna encode that information there. Just like TCP sequence numbers state which bytes they're sending, right? You didn't talk oh, about uh, the other thing is, what if we have multiple, what if we're sending multiple of these packets to the same server? Like, what if we've broken into several different systems? We have them all sending messages to us. How can we differentiate between those two? Those four. Server number kind of thing. Server number, yeah, we need some kind of identifier, right? To identify a unique message pair, right? Mm -hmm. So that's actually what we're gonna use, the lower eight bits of the identification field. So in a sense, if you think about it, right, so the ID field in an IP header contains the, um, tells us which IP packets come from the same single packet if it's fragmented, right? So we're gonna squeeze that concept of an identifier down to eight bits, right? So that will identify a single message transfer. And then the higher eight bits will specify the actual byte that's being sent. Yeah? Are we gonna limit the size of this? get to in a second. So this identifier is going to remain constant while sending one message. So this is what specifies 
I'm going to send you some bytes, and here's how you know all those bytes are from the same message. So these have the last four, just like an ID, have to be consistent. Then I guess the question of then how do I know? How do I specify which bytes I am sending? Is it the zeroth byte, the first byte, the second byte, the nth byte? So we're going to use the fragmentation offset. So we're going to use the lower eight, so this is where it gets a little bit complicated, right? We're going to use the lower eight bits of the fragmentation message, of the fragmentation <coughs> offset. So that's going to tell us that if it's zero, it means this byte that's in the high eight bits of identification, that's the zeroth byte of the message. Mm -hmm. If it's one, it's going to say it's the first byte of the message. Two, it's going to be the second byte of the message. But we're not, we don't want to be too loud, so we're not going to do any kind of act, acting or anything like that, right? This is just information that the client needs to know in order to successfully get the message. Okay, but key question, how do we know when we've sent the whole message? It's not possible to know without acting, right? No, maybe we can yeah. send it top down like uh, 30,000, 29,000, I mean, just go down. But how do you know that you didn't drop 30,001? Yeah, so we either need to send a size or send some kind of sentinel to say that, hey, we're done. We've actually sent you all of it. Right? Yeah, we can always, you know, those, all those packets can get dropped, but we need some way to do this. So we're going to use the sentinel uh, thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the highest bit of the fragmentation offset will be set to 1, and the lower 8 bits of the fragmentation offset will be the entire size of the message that we've sent. So we're actually kind of going to do 2. So if this, byte, if this bit here is a 1, then that means this lower 8 bits is the size of the message that was sent to you. So for example, so questions on like the high, high level idea? Okay. Uh, so this means, so because of size, we're using eight bits to represent the size. So we can only send messages of size two to the eight minus one. That's the size of messages we can actually send. There is a bit that specifies like where to fragment. In the uh, yes, there's a uh, thing in here. There's one of these flags is the it is fragmented, and there's more fragments. We're actually going to keep those as zero, so we're going to okay. treat these as non-fragmented package packets, because if it happens to be that this whatever data does get fragmented, we want the OS to reassemble those packets for us. Although it's going to mess up the offset, so whatever. We're going to assume that doesn't happen. Yes, there's eight and one, yep. nine and 13, four, by, four bits. Yeah, we're gonna ignore the four bits in there. Cool, okay, so the idea is when we execute, when, we, when your program executes and we get an IP address and an interface, uh, the type and the test, so it's gonna generate some random ID for this an 8-bit identifier to identify the transfer, right? So let's say hex 41, whatever that is. So where is he going to put this random ID? The lower 8 bits of identification, right? Yeah, and it's going to be constant for every packet we send while sending this message. So then we're doing tests. So what's test in ASCII? The T, sorry, what's T in ASCII? Sixty-five. Actually, no, idea. It's twenty-seven. 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 So let's think about this first. Before we even look at what's going on, to make sure we understand how many packets are we going to send in total. Four. Five actually. Five. Why the fifth? The size. Yeah, we can just tell them we're done. So we send the T, the E, the S, the T. And then a tiger at the end that says we're done, and we sent this many bytes. 
right? So the first packet is going to encode that T into the upper bits. It's going to encode 41 into the lower bits. And then the, uh, the fragmentation offset is going to be all zeros. So we know it's the zeroth byte of, this, uh, of the message. The next packet is going to encode the E, which is hex 65. It's going to keep ID consistent. It's going to increment the fragmentation offset. And then we're going to encode the S. I think go in my head. Uh, 73, 41, right? The same thing. And we're going to do two. And then we send the last one, the T. 74, 41, 3 to say it's the third byte. And then now what are we going to do for the last one? What's going to be the lower eight bits of this fragmentation offset? Plus one. Plus one. No, no, plus it's going to be four. The lower eight bits four. are going to be four. four. The high bit is going to be set as one. Right. Uh, what's this going to be? Whatever. One it doesn't matter. Yes, no. It doesn't matter what the high bits are. Does the lower bits matter? Yeah, right? That's how we can identify that it came from this one, this same message. So yeah, this, these can be zero. It doesn't really matter what these are. But this could be 41, and this can be, this has to be 1004, one for this high 13th bit. Why are we setting the high bits to one? To specify that it's the last, okay. yeah, that it's the yeah. last message. Otherwise, if this wasn't one, we would consider that the fourth byte of, or the zero, one, two, three, fourth byte was zip byte zero, which is totally valid. We could do that, right? But we need to know when to end. So now we can actually, we can do, the client can do some kind of cool checking, right? So the client can say, okay, I know if I get this message that says, hey, this is the end, and this is how many bytes in total that I sent as a message, I can check, did I receive all of those bytes? Right, those offsets. If I did, then I have the message. Right? If I'm missing something, then I just go crap. I don't know the message. I know everything except for a few bytes. Right? Maybe I'll wait until some packets get in. If I never get this message, though, if this last packet gets dropped, what do I do? What was that? Uh, but we don't ever talk to the server, so. Yeah, timeout, right? We just say, we wait for a while, and then we say, mm, okay, I didn't get anything within 30 seconds, so whatever, something happened, but maybe I got some data, so that's good enough, right? So this should, you know, it's kind of designed this, so it'd be a cool, so you have to do some nitty gritty packet manipula manipulations and byte twiddling, or bit twiddling, uh, but also to think about, you know, the reliability guarantees that TCP gets you, mm -hmm. right? And the fact that we're not using that means we can't really guarantee any of these sending, but we can still use some concepts in there. Do we be using like PTL to specify the timeout? Uh, no. You don't want to mess with TCL because no. otherwise your packets, like the time goes further down, your packets may not get there. Okay. So you can do this in any language you want, just like the last project. Uh, I recommend that you use Python and use the Scappy library. It is really good. Uh, it's fairly easy to understand and use and to create and manipulate packets. Um, the other option you can do is to use LibNet and use whatever bindings in the language of your choice that you know interface to LibNet. But you have to use, you know, you're going to have to use an arbitrary package. You're going to have to create arbitrary packets, right? The operating system is not going to create these IP packets for you. So you have to manually create them. And so if there's a library that helps you do that, totally supportive of that. Uh, I'm also very supportive of, if on the mailing list, you want to talk about which libraries you're using, whatever, that's also totally good. Um, you know, but you have to do the research, right? And say, okay, if you start using a library and then four days from now you find out, oh, it turns out I can't actually do what I want to do and change the IP, the ID field of this packet, we got problems, like you have problems. I think Scappy does support like packet drafting. Oh yeah, Scappy does, it's awesome. That's why I, I support it. Mm -hmm. But if there's something that exists in your language of choice, feel free. But I want you to know that like, if you vary off the beaten path, right? That's, that's your responsibility to make sure it works. Okay, so we've seen that to, in order to access raw sockets and just create raw packets, you need to have root privileges. Right? So keep this in mind when you're developing your code. Right, You're going to have to run your own code as root to test it. 
This also means your system is going to be running, the submission system will be running your code as root. <laughs> I'm trying to take precautions, but it's very tricky. So I'm going to try to do the best so that you're not going to crash, but don't do anything overtly malicious with this power. Right? It's also why it's taking me a while to figure out how to do this stuff. Uh, other than that, everything else is the same. Packages file, submission instructions, uh, submit on the website. The submissions aren't up yet, but they will be soon. Any questions on part two? Part one? Sorry. You want this to be the only one? Okay, part one. All right. Part two. Part two, now we're transitioning. So assignment one, part one here is about creating things so you can understand how this low level protocols and everything we're talking about actually work. Um, now you're gonna start breaking things in a good way. And that's what your goal is gonna be for this part. So the idea is you have just been hired by a hot new startup that just got series A money. Uh, They've created this amazing web service that has the best, fanciest graphics and styling that you could ever imagine uh, to allow other companies to securely execute only trusted code, <laughs> right? So awesome web service, it's super cool. Uh, they're using this really good encryption program called Checksum, which I'll let you look at what that is. So they've hired you. How do you prove to them that you broke their system? By deleting everything? No, don't do that. Put a file on there. Yeah, right? So they put a file on there called secret.txt in the working directory of where their program is running. So if you can read the contents of this file, you have successfully broken the service. All right. <coughs> so that's the goal state you're working towards. The link will be, I'll send you the link in the mailing list because I don't want to deal with access control issues and making sure you're logged in to access it, it's a huge pain. Uh, so I'm just gonna distribute the link there. Don't try to share it out too much. It's clearly a service with, I mean, there should be a way you can execute arbitrary code on one of our servers, right? So, you know, be safe, don't do that. Uh, there will be hints, oh, I pretty saw the title. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put some hints on here. They'll be like collapsed, so you can kind of self-check when you get stuck. Maybe you can expand them that way. I mean, it's, it's like a puzzle, right? So you have to try to solve the puzzle. So I'll put some hints in there so you don't go too far astray so that you can stay on track. But I don't know. For me, I like the challenge of doing it without any hints or anything. So I will, I'll let you decide that. Okay, so when you submit on the assignment submission, you'll submit the secret, right? So what is the secret? The secret.txt file. The content of the secret.txt file. Do not submit secret.txt. <laughs> That's not a secret. Right? It's whatever is in that file. Okay, this is a very vague what you use to break the service, right? So the code that you wrote to break the service, submit that. Um, and a README. I don't care about make files for this. I don't really want to make your code. Uh, and I want this README to be more descriptive than normal, right? Because all I see is yes. I wrote the secret, here's the thing. It's very easy to, once it is broken, it's no longer a secret, right? Uh, so I want a description of how you did it, right? How'd you break it, what led you to that? Uh, what programs did you have to write to help you break it? What was the thing you used to actually break the circuit? So any questions about that? So we're gonna be reading those and grading based off that. All right, cool. So here's the link. Here's the beautiful, crazy, the best website you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> so. I think I already have this, but let's. All right. Uh, all right, so there are files on here. So it's so secure, it's the most secure file you've ever seen in your life. 
So I can submit code here. Uh, that's weird with the slash. I don't think that'll break anything. I hope it don't break anything in the middle of this demo. <laughs> code output, hello world. Yay. Mm. <laughs> it actually works. That's surprising. If we look at it, we can see that my code outputted hello world. Yay. <laughs> so this actually came. So it securely executed code, right? Yeah. It executed this trusted code. Is, is this server running on a Linux machine or Windows machine? Or it's running on a Linux machine. It's running on a 14.04, everything we've been using to uh, okay. do everything. So if I go to downloads, uh, Python, uh, right? So let's say, what do you want me to print out? <laughs> Does it just read like this? Uh, yeah. Oops. Read all. Read all? No, no, read. Just read, yeah, it's like that, right? So I'll return a string, I'm gonna print that string out. All right, time to break it. You guys only have one thing to do. Part two done for all. Come on, it's not that simple. I can run code we haven't signed. <laughs> it's a secure web service, guys. They don't get give out money to just anyone. Um, so this is your goal. You have to figure out what's going on here. So there'll be hints, there'll be pointers, but for right now. We have a limit type of this one, do we? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you have complete access to this. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You just have you have unlimited access to this URL. You can do whatever you want. Um, you can try to do whatever you want. So the code will be running only if the hash is correct? I don't know. You have to find out. Mm -hmm. yeah. There'll be some hints for that. I don't want to give you away too much right now. Okay. But yeah, you want, I want you to poke around and try to figure out what's... I've given you some hints about what kind of hashing is being used. So I want you to look at these files. I'm going to post some links to GPG so you can figure out how GPG works. Um, there's hints in file names, there's all kinds of hints. But the end goal is to get the contents of? The end goal is to get the contents of secret.txt. Okay. Exactly, yeah. So you want to essentially want to execute something like this, right? We have to get the system to do it. Questions? Other questions? Yeah. When's the assignment going to get posted? Because I'm not seeing what you're saying. Now. Got it. Although I don't think there's any links to it, so kind of now. You can guess URLs, you're good. Okay. Chug, 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 chug. Nope. Oh, it's kind of done yet. It's slow going. It's so slow. Okay. It'll be in underscore assignment too. Uh, okay, any other questions? Should be released. Great. Right, let's get started. All right, back to applications. I think we were at, so we talked about vulnerabilities, we talked about compilation. We're here, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about interpretation, and now I want to talk about high-level source code is compiled, right? So I think everybody in this room should have taken or is in the process of taking 340 or the equivalent of compilers, part of the required classes, more or less. So you should be familiar in some sense with the compilation process, right? So we're going to kind of tackle it at a high level. So in C, right, the first thing that happens is the preprocessor goes through and expands all of the macros and all the pound defined, so anything with a pound in front of it in C or C++ is done by the preprocessor. Then the compiler takes the output of the preprocessor, and what's the, what's the output of the compiler? What's its goal? What was it? Uh, talk about C and C++. Object code. Object code, yeah. 
something that's executable at the end, right? So for whatever architecture, whatever operating system you're interested in, it, we want it to be executable. Uh, so it's, it, but at first, the way it does that, right, at a high level, this is what it does, right? But really, it's kind of broken up into different segments. So first, the compiler is turning it essentially into our C or C++ program into assembly code, mm -hmm. right? So GCC is the C compiler. If you want to, if you just run GCC on a C file, right, it's going to do the whole thing and spit out an executable. But with different flags, you can actually force it to show you the output of the various stages. Mm -hmm. So you can use the dash capital S flag to generate the assembly file. So this can actually be really useful to understand what's going on, especially uh, with what we're going to be doing is looking at things at a very low level, right? Because we want to understand how is this code actually implemented in assembly and how is the machine actually executed. Uh, nowadays, most of the time, if you're running, if you're doing this on a 64-bit machine, you're going to want to use the dash M32 flag, which says generate 32-bit assembly or executable. Uh, this way, you're going to be consistent with what we're working on because we're going to focus exclusively on x86. So 32-bit, we're going to ignore 64-bit, so that way we can just focus on one thing at a time. Okay. So then after the compiler generates the assembly, what tool goes next, or what process goes next? The linker and the loader. Almost. Right? The linker, the linker links up object files, but right now we just have a, an assembly file. A list of x86 assembly instructions. What do we need something to do at a high level? You don't know the name. What do we want something to do to fit into this pipeline? And get the machine code. And yeah, we need machine code, right? We want something that turns in assembly instructions, which is just text instructions, to actual ones and zeros that the computer can understand, right? So that's the job of the assembler. So the assembler yes. takes in the assembly file and outputs a binary, some kind of binary object. Right now we're using binary object very broadly. So on Linux, uh, the assembler is called AS. That's the program name. And so what's this binary object? Is it ones and zeros that the, just goes right to the CPU that the CPU executes, like just a bunch of code? Into one final executable. Mm -hmm. 
right? So we need to try to resolve all of the references, right? So we can say, hey, so it's actually not until here at the linker stage where we say, hey, you're using a function that's never defined, right? Like nobody, nobody uh, defined that function, right? So that's actually why um, the Linux linker is LD, and that's why if you use GCC and you compile a C file and you use a function that's not defined, right? If you've declared that function, you're saying that's going to come somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You'll actually get an error from LD, and it'll show you in the error output LD colon, and it'll show you the error message, right? Because it's coming from the linker. Your program compiles just fine. It translates into x86, and then it assembles just fine. It translates into a binary object, but it can't create a final executable because you're trying to call a function that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So what's, so what's static linking? So what does it mean when we statically link code, assembly, C? Isn't it mapping like the exact representation of other functions? Kind of. Yeah. We know which function can be called before having the data. Exactly. And then what do we do with it? Is that ever is that function ever going to change when we execute the program? No, we actually take that code and put it in with our executable. So our executable version of that function always gets called. Right? You can actually do this with the libc library. So you can statically link printf or whatever from the library. So at compile time, you take that that thing, you put that function in with your executable, and this way ship this binary to anybody, right? They don't need all these libraries. They don't need to know that you are specifically using version blah, blah, blah of libc or version blah, blah, blah of OpenSSL, right? Because you statically linked it. But what happens to your binary? Yeah. Expands. Ah, it gets huge, right? These libraries are big, right? Then you have to ship around all these. Uh, anybody do any Go programming? No? Open. Doesn't Go statically link all their executables? The output is just a binary that you can always just run. You don't need a Go runtime. I think that's one of the one of the benefits of Go. So what's the opposite of static linking? Dynamic, right? Anybody do Windows programming? What's a DLL for? Yeah, dynamically loaded library, right? This is something that's loaded at runtime by the code, right? So the code is an executable. It says, I'm relying on these functions, but they don't actually exist in my code. They exist in this other DLL, and it has this name and maybe this version, right? Uh, so the same thing here. So we have dynamic linking that Linux does just the same thing. So normally when you compile a program, right, and you use the printf function, by default you're doing dynamic linking. So you call printf, at runtime, your program goes out and asks the system, okay, What's the latest version of libc? Like, who has printf? And then it loads in that code for you to execute. So what are some of the benefits there? Yeah? Uh, since printf in this is called, uh, if we want to have printf standing in the system back in the kernel, uh, kernel that is called print into a binary, right? Sure. Yeah. Not quite. Printf isn't a system call. Printf is a libc. It's in, still in user space. There actually is a kernel version of